man, what an incredible, incredible week. Man, I'm so thankful just to echo what Pat was saying uh, for a church that just invests into families. Um, whether it's student ministry or kids ministry or preschool, man, it is so awesome to be a part of a church that values and really pours into our kids and to our families. Um, just to be an incredible voice uh, of discipleship, to tell our kids about Jesus at a young age. Uh, it was an incredible, incredible week, as Pat said. It's like 700 something kids. Um, I mean, I invite them over to your house tomorrow for the cookout. I hope that's okay. But, um, just kidding, y'all didn't think that was funny. That's all right. Um, that's, that's fine. Uh, but uh, no, it was incredible. Uh, my wife, Sloan, was actually, she's like the snack lady. She was in charge of all the snacks for VBS. Can you imagine feeding that many kids, 300 volunteers every single day for the week? Um, and so uh, she was in charge of that. But so thankful for the many people who volunteered. Obviously couldn't do that uh, without them. And, and so this time next year, uh, we would love your help. So just be thinking about that. How can I help? Um, it's from Monday to Thursday, from 9 to 12. <clears throat> and so you'll get some more information about this time next year, a little bit sooner. Man, we'd love for you to help. We have many people from uh, Five Forks helping, but it's always, as we continue to expand and grow, need your help. But let's dig into God's Word this morning. Does that sound good? Y'all with me? All right. So uh, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Exodus chapter 6, Exodus chapter 6. Um, if we haven't met, let me introduce myself. If you're a guest, my name's Dustin. I'm a teaching pastor here. And man, it's always an honor to, to walk through and to really, yeah, okay, you can call it preaching, but to communicate what God says in his word, but also, man, what he's teaching all of us, how he's working in my life, how he's working in your life. Uh, this is, um, we do this together, all right? We're growing in our walk with God. And we have been walking, this is the fifth week now of this Exodus series that we've titled Into the Wilderness. So if this is your first Sunday, you can go back online and kind of pick up. You can also, on your way out, pick up um, what we call a reading plan card. You can kind of read and catch yourself up. It's this incredible, Incredible, incredible story of God delivering his people, that the Israelites, God's chosen people, were in Egypt, they are enslaved, and this incredible story of God calling this guy named Moses, how he's going to use him, and another guy named Aaron to help free um, the Israelites from the slavery, from this um, evil king, Pharaoh. And we have been walking through, and really the last couple of weeks, really honing in, you're going to see this all throughout Exodus, is really honing in on God's plan. Um, to think about what is God's plan for my life? How do we know God's plan? How do we obey God's plan? All those different things. And as I was preparing and studying for this, I think one of the problems that we, we really face, each and every one of us, even the most, quote, Christian person that we face on a daily basis is really this problem of narcissism. And I don't think it's a problem that you and I show up to work or family cookout tomorrow and say, hey, guys, man, I hope you've had a great week. I'm a narcissist, okay? We don't do that. But if you're really honest, man, we think about ourselves a lot, right? We just do. We think about ourselves. Um, yesterday, I was cutting the grass. It's super embarrassing. But I have a riding, riding lawnmower, and I have Bermuda grass, so I'm a nerd. So I cut it super low. And um, so I was cutting the grass, and we have like this water meter, like in our front yard. When I say water meter, it's not like sticking out, sticking out, but it's like a flat metal thing. I don't know how this happened, but in my rotting lawnmower, I ran over it. Somehow my blade like caught the lid of, my, uh, of the water meter, picked it up, and it like got stuck in my blades, okay? So I'm thinking, okay, I'm coming out. It's making this, I have my earbuds in, so it's like, and the whole thing's shaking. I'm like, I don't know what to do. So I'm like trying to turn it off. My wife Sloan comes out. She's thinking I'm dead, okay? She's like, are you okay? And you know what I was worried about? Man, my grass is gonna be messed up now. Like, it's scalped, okay? Because... I want my yard to look good because it's a reflection of me. We think about ourselves a lot. Every day, if not every hour, we are subconsciously or even consciously thinking about things like, hey, what are people thinking or saying about me? How, what, if I wear this, are people going to like it? There's a reason that we get in front of the mirror before we leave and we're like, man, everything look good. You know, you might be wondering, when's the last time you combed your hair, bro? I don't, okay? But we all look in front of the mirror. We wanna look good. We, we want people to like us and we're thinking about ourselves. We ask questions like this. Will this make me happy? If 
I make this decision, if I make this purchase, is it going to make me happy? Is this decision going to push me forward in life? If I take this job, if I buy this house, am I going to get this car? All of these things, we are thinking about ourselves all the time. But it also kind of is twofold where while we're thinking about ourselves, we also do this and we kind of hide it and say we are thinking about others, but it's in a very negative way because we're still thinking about ourselves in this comparison trap. Now, there are times where we look at people, we compare ourselves, and we're like, man, you know, like, those are some really sick shoes, or, hey, that's a nice dress, where'd you get it? You know, okay, that kind of stuff. But there's also times where we compare ourselves to make ourselves feel good, because we're narcissists, that we're like, did you see their dress? (laughs) You know, did you see their car? How do they even afford that house? What, what are they thinking? Have you seen their kids and how their kids behave? And how dare you talk about my boys like that, okay? But um, now just think about this. But we're always comparing these different things. And at the end of the day, we put ourselves in the middle of it, whether it is, I'm not saying bad things. I'm not saying you should just wake up and be like, huh, who cares what anybody says, you know, um, whatever. But we have to be very, very careful with this narcissism because what ends up happening? And this is the problem that you and I face if you are a follower of Jesus, is that narcissism begins to bleed into our relationship with God, into our spiritual walk and following God. And it really kind of, these are two different extremes, is that one, we can become so focused on ourselves that what ends up happening is we come to the conclusion of thinking of ourselves so highly to the point where we say, I don't need God. You probably know people like that. You might even wrestle with that to say, you know what? I have everything. This is, man, this is really the American dream. Man, I got everything. I have a nice car. I have a beautiful family. I got a stable job, a house. Man, we're not struggling to pay the bills. Why would I need God? There are, you don't need me to tell you this. There are so many people in our world, and I'm, I'm not saying this in a judgmental way, Stance. I'm just, it's reality. So many people that slept in this morning, read their paper, are washing their cars and marinating a steak for tomorrow that would say, I don't need Jesus. And so we think so highly of ourselves. Then because of that, as an outcome, we believe messed up theology like this. Uh, you know what? I can be good enough to get to heaven. We can say things like, you know what, there probably isn't a hell because hell is scary and I don't want to feel bad about myself and God wouldn't do that. So it's probably just heaven. And so we have to be very careful. Now on the flip side of that is an extreme thing that we would not just think highly of ourselves, but too lowly of ourselves. That we're so centered on ourselves that we would say things like this. I don't have what it takes. There's no way God could use someone like me. Does he know, like, if God is real, he knows my baggage. He knows my family dynamic. He knows the hurt and the pain. He knows all the sin, uh, past, present, and future. There's no way he could forgive me. We buy in to those things. And what I would challenge you and what what we're going to see kind of unfold in this story, really beginning today in the story of Moses, is that for you and me as believers, there's kind of this sweet spot between those two extremes that really falls in line with what I would describe in two words, humble obedience. That you and I, our lives as followers of Jesus should be marked by humble obedience. When people see you and I and see our lives, it should be someone that said, people say, man, he's really humble, but he obeys the Lord. And so there's like this um, problem that we face that when we're thinking of ourselves, we're too arrogant to fully obey God because we think we can show God something or we know God, we know a little bit more than God. We kind of see that with Moses. We saw that um, last week. But then there's also this obedience to realize, you know what? I don't have what it takes and I need to obey God because when I obey God, that is what faithfulness looks like. And what we're going to unpack this morning is really looking at Moses and Aaron, his sidekick, of really what is about to happen. Because up to this point in the story of Exodus, if you really think about it, Moses has thought only about himself. 
God shows up, this burning bush moment, says, I'm going to use you. You're going to go to Pharaoh. I'm going to use you. I'm going to do some signs and wonders. You're going to tell Pharaoh this, and he's going to let my people go. And Moses is only thinking about himself, and he's like, <laughs> no. He's like, they're not going to believe me. The elders of Israel aren't going to believe me. Pharaoh's not going to believe me. And so, you know what? I'm not of good speech. He even says that. I'm not eloquent with my words. I'm not a good communicator. I can't persuade King Pharaoh. And so send somebody else. Then God comes. He's like, no, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this and I'm going to use you. And still Moses is like, no, you know what? I'm just not the right fit. And over and over and over, we see this me-centered mentality in Moses' life where he's, he's continuing to focus on himself. And here's what we can learn from this. Moses is more focused on his weaknesses and his inabilities and inadequacies than he is on the power of God, of what God can do. God doesn't say, you know what, you know what, you're kind of, you really do have some weaknesses. You know what, I'm going to pass over. I'm going to go over here to the superstar hero that has it all together. That is not part of the deal. And so I'm going to tell you my first point, and then we're going to read Scripture. But the first thing that we're going to see this morning as we are about to unpack this in chapter 6 is that God calls inadequate people. We should all say amen to that, all right? Because I don't know what your mom or your grandma told you, and she's like, I love you. You can set your mind to it. You can do anything that you want. You're the, you're the apple of my eye, okay? I love that. I'm not saying don't have dreams, but at the end of the day, we're going to experience failures, and we're, we're not going to have all, all, it all together all the time. We are inadequate without God. And what we're going to see here is in chapter 6, we come to this section in verses 14 through 20, um, 25 is this genealogy of Moses and Aaron. Now, I'm not going to read it all because I would botch half the names, but I'm just going to confess to you as a pastor, and you would probably agree with me. If you've ever studied the Bible, maybe you're doing a reading plan app or something, and you come to a genealogy, most of the time you and I just skip it, <laughs> right? And if you attempt to read it, you spend more time trying to pronounce the names correctly. And I don't know, half the times when I pronounce biblical names, I have no clue if it's right. You know, I just try to say it with confidence. And you're like, yeah, that sounds about right. Now, I don't know, okay? But so often we come to these, these genealogies and they're all throughout scripture. And it's kind of like, nah, okay. Or sometimes I remember when I first became a Christian and you try to read stuff like this and you're like, you start reading and you come across a name and you're like, Big name, <laughs> you know, you just say that instead of trying to pronounce it. Or you're like, really, really hard name, okay. Or you call him something short, like his name is Jebediah. And you're like, okay, I'm just going to call him Jeb or whatever. And so we usually just kind of skip through this. But here's where I, I don't want us just to fly by this this morning. Because there is a reason that God has those genealogies in Scripture. And most often, God puts those in Scripture to prove a point. And so I'm going to read this, and then I'm going to show you what the point is that God is showing. So we get through this genealogy, and let's pick up chapter 6, uh, starting in verse 26. So we go through all this family tree, and it says, the, uh, These are um, the Aaron and Moses, to whom the Lord said, Bring out the people of Israel from the land of Egypt by their host. It was they who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, about bringing out the people of Israel from Egypt, this Moses and this Aaron. And on the day when the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, the Lord said to Moses, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say to you. But Moses said to the Lord, here we go again. Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips. How will Pharaoh listen to me? So in this point that God calls inadequate people, here's the point that God is making. So we see this family tree. And if you were to study all of these names, one, most of them we never hear of again. And the ones that we do hear of again in scripture, it is not a pretty sight. That if you look at this list of people, it, it, it really is rooted in incest, adultery, disobedience, um, anger, all of these different things. And it's like, here's the family tree of Moses and Aaron. Now, we all have family problems, right? I, I would say none of us, if you raise your hand and said you had a perfect family, you're, you're probably the problem, okay? But 
you know, we all have dynamics. We always have a, a crazy cousin. We always have stories and all that stuff. And I'm not discounting that. I think it's part of God's plan that God calls inadequate people. Moses and Aaron, in, in, in our sense, were inadequate. And God is showing this family lineage and saying, hey, th this is the tribe of Levi. The, um, it's really a Levitical uh, branch of really priest. And it says, look at all this dysfunction. God is laying out all the brokenness on the table. I mean, for everybody to see and says, hey, this is the lineage. This is the family tree of Aaron and Moses. Now, I always kind of use stuff like this when people say, you know, people, uh, over time, the Bible's been tampered with. They have pulled things out because it, they want it to look pretty and prestige and, you know, button up to prove who God is. And I would say if I'm going to write scripture that way, I'm not including this messed up family tree. I mean, this is literally the equivalent of you going to Ancestry.com and finding out your great-great-grandfather was an SS commander for Nazi Germany, okay? Now, and if that was you, all right, and you found that out, you're definitely not sharing that with people, all right? It's like you come and you meet somebody, you're at a party or wedding and small talk, and it's like, hey, where's your family from? We're um, from Germany. And it's like, oh, really? Did you do like Ancestry.com? Yeah, we did. I mean, we're German. We like, you know, big pretzels and bratwurst and whatever, you know, fill in the blank. And it's like, oh, okay, yeah, you know, Sprechen Sie Dutch, <laughs> you know? I mean, something, but you're not talking about, yeah, I found out in my family tree, my great-great-grandfather worked for, was a Nazi, okay? We just don't share that. But we see intentionally God is laying this out to show he calls inadequate people. He calls people like you and me that have marked up past, struggle with sin. We don't have it all together. We're not perfect by any means. And Moses and Aaron were that same way. That in this, we see that God is wanting to communicate really this incredible reality that he calls inadequate people. And I want to say this just to kind of bring it home and make it personal. Think about this. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. I hope that you have. God is calling you to something. Well, first and foremost, he's calling you to a relationship with him. Not church attendance, not tithing. First and foremost, he is calling you to an intimate relationship with him. For you to communicate and be on the same page and for you to want to know him and desire to be with him. But beyond that, he's also calling you to something. I don't have, I can't fill in the blank that's different for all of us. I do know at the very basic level, God has called you and me to be missionaries every single day. It's not just my job of, oh, that's your job, pastor. You go talk about it and you teach us and then we'll see you next Sunday. When you leave this place, it is your responsibility to tell people about Jesus. That is clearly marked in the New Testament, that it is our calling to do that. Now, the context of that, some are called to go move overseas, be full-time missionaries. Some are called to be school teachers and to love on kids and minister to parents. Some are called to be engineers and be really smart and make sure people don't die, but work with your coworkers. And, you know, the, the, the list goes on and on, but we are all called to this incredible mission for people to see Jesus in us and for um, people to see Jesus regardless of what the circumstances are to bring them back to that hope. I love what D.L. Moody says. He was a author, theologian. Um, there's also a Moody Bible Institute, a school in Chicago, um, a seminary that's there. But he wrote this in a commentary. He said, Moses spent 40 years thinking he was somebody 40 years learning that he was nobody, and then 40 years discovering what God can do with a nobody. Now, I love this. I always try to find like the humor in scripture is that after this family dynamic plays out in this, we see that it says, these are the Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, bring out these people. It says, it was they who spoke, this Moses and this Aaron. It's almost as if the Bible knows that they're messed up and they're writing in such a way that the ancient readers of the day would be like, I know a Moses. Certainly God wouldn't use that guy. I've met his uncle and aunt, you know. I mean, if you were to study this lineage, seriously, 
go back and study it, study it, you will find out Moses' dad married Moses' aunt, okay? That's a weird family reunion, all right? You show up, like, what do you call your mom aunt, all right? Don't, hopefully you don't have that problem. Um, but, but anyway, it's, it's just messed up. And so it's even written, Scripture's writing it like, yeah, we are clearly saying this Aaron and this Moses in the midst of all of their baggage, this is what it is. And here's the truth. If you're taking notes this morning, I love this, man. I was so reminded God just hit me over the head with this. Our weaknesses are not a barrier for God's glory, but instead a platform for his glory. Now think about that. Our weaknesses are not a barrier for God's glory. He doesn't look at you and discount you and say, you know what? You got a little too much baggage, so I can't work through you. I can't use you. Next, take a number. But instead, it's actually a platform to say, in spite of your weaknesses, in spite of your present struggles, your past mistakes, I want to work through you. God works through broken people. We're all broken. And God wants to work through that. He wants to use you in the midst of that struggle, in the midst of that pain, whatever the hurt is, he wants to work through that. I love what the apostle Paul says to the church of Corinth. Um, He talks about how great um, God told him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Let me say that again. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. God's power is made perfect in our weakness. And so Paul says this, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He realizes and acknowledges, man, I'm pretty jacked up. I have some weaknesses, But I'm going to boast on those things because it shows how much more powerful God is, how awesome his grace is, how awesome salvation is, because I can't do it by myself. And through my weaknesses, God is getting the glory. It is a platform to say, God used him? God used her? In the midst of all of that, how many times have you and I heard this, uh, heard an amazing story, be like, man, God changed that person's life. But if the same is true, I've heard people say this when I did student ministry, I would say, hey, how did you come to find God or what's your testimony? That's kind of church language. What's your testimony? And students would say, well, I don't really have a good testimony. I'm like, well, what do you mean? They're like, well, I didn't like do drugs, you know, do all these bad things. And then God saved me. I just, I grew up in church. Well, it's the same grace. And we're all being saved from sin and eternity and hell. And so it doesn't matter if you were on this, you know, highway to hell or if you grew up in church. The gra- God's grace is God's grace. We all have this incredible story that God uses as a platform to bring him glory. So that brings me to our second point this morning. Let me read the next passage before we get to that. Um, in, in verses, um, starting in chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, listen to what happens. So after Moses makes this another excuse, read along with me in chapter 7. It says, the Lord said to Moses, see, I have made you like God to Pharaoh and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of this land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I, multi- and though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and I will bring my host, my people, the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel and from among them. Moses and Aaron did so and they did just as the Lord commanded them. Now Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 years old when they spoke To Pharaoh. Now, I love this. Find a little bit of humor. You know, Moses wrote this. He's like, I'm 80. Aaron's really old. He's 83. Okay, just by the way. But in this, here's what we what we see in this. Not only does God call inadequate people, but number two, the second point is that God is always the main character. The gospel is about God and God alone. All throughout Scripture, it points to God because we are have this narcissistic bent we tend to kind of put us as the main character of the gospel. 
And then what ends up happening is we go through life and we're like, hey, you know what? God didn't meet my needs. You know, this was my plan. God didn't meet that. And so I'm going to back out of this whole faith in Jesus thing. It doesn't make sense. If if he really was a loving God, he would meet my needs. If he really was true and faithful, then it wouldn't happen. I wouldn't face this struggle. Fill in the blank. And so what ends up happening is because we put us at the center and we make ourselves the main character, when it doesn't go according to plan, we back out. And kind of the buzzword nowadays is we deconstruct our faith. And then we're like, you know what? Jesus isn't real. All this other stuff. Well, God is the main character. Whatever church or whoever tells you you're the main character, it is, it is false prophecy. It is not true. It is a lie. What we see in this is that even in the midst of Moses and Aaron doubting themselves, God says, I underlined it because I want to see how many times, God says this in this passage, I have made you like God. I command you. I will harden Pharaoh's heart. I will multiply my signs. I will lay my hand. I will stretch my my hand. He didn't say, hey, you do all these things and I'm just gonna be in the background of the story. He's like, no, I am the main character of this entire thing. And here's the reality, that although God wants to use you and he calls you, God's plan isn't about you. Now you're like, wow, that's really encouraging. Happy 4th of July, pastor, you know. But we have to understand this. God's plan, while he wants us to be a part of it and he calls us into it, it's not about your wants and dreams and your desires. Now, the last time I checked, you and I, all of us, while it might look different, we're really, really blessed. And that God is still working in us, but it's not God's plan to just you, for you to be the main character. Now, I think sometimes we approach God with kind of this attitude like, God, you need me. And I don't know if, I mean, if you've ever approached him that way, you might not have said it out loud like that. But I think about this analogy. I have a younger brother. He's four years younger than me. And it was probably like late high school. He's probably senior in high school, maybe early in his college days. And he worked at the Great American Cookie Company in the mall. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like really good cookies. They put crack in them, so you come back, all right, and they charge like $6. Um, It's like crumble cookie. Those are better, though. But anyway, my brother worked for Great American Cookie Company, and his job at this point in time was to get to the mall super early, like 5 a.m., and he like would scoop the cookies, put them on the pan, and bake them for all the customers of the day. And like that was like he was the guy, no doubt about it. So he calls me one day and he's like, Dustin, you're not going to believe this. He was like, you know, I've been working. I've had like, I've worked six days straight and I asked for two days off and my boss will not give me two days off. Can you believe that? And I'm like, yeah, I can't believe it. It's a mall job. Okay. And I was like, you know, so what are you going to do? And he's like, I'm just not coming in. He goes, they need me to make cookies and how dare they not give me a day or two off. So I'm like, oh, okay, go for it, man. See how that works, okay? So he, he doesn't show up for a couple of days. And then he goes back to work and he shows up and he's like, hey, I'm here. He wasn't on the schedule. And you know what his boss said? You're fired, right? Like, why'd you even show up? You, you, you didn't show up those days. You were scheduled. You put us in a bind and now you didn't show up. My brother had the audacity. <laughs> this is so funny. And if he's watching, he'll be embarrassed. I'm telling him this and hate me later, but is that he had the audacity to tell the boss, hey, you need me. You know, I make all the cookies at this place every day. And if it wasn't for me making all those cookies, you couldn't sell cookies. And if you didn't sell cookies, you couldn't make money. So you need me. And he, my brother told me, he told, he's like, and they just kind of laughed and said, we don't care, you're fired. He's like, can you believe that? I'm like, no, man, I cannot believe that. That's, how dare them do that? You know, you're the best cookie maker in the history of great American, you know? And I was like, yeah, I can't believe that. And he's like, they need me. And I'm like, Ryan, listen, they don't need you. They're gonna hire some other 17-year-old, make a minimum wage, and they'll just scoop cookies, okay? That's all they need. They don't care about you. But I think so often we approach God with the same attitude. You need me. And if things don't go according to plan, okay, I quit. You know what? I'm the guy. I'm God's gift to this earth. And you need me, God. You know, you need the disciples and you need me this. Man, God does not need us. He is the main character. And everything that you and I do in life should be about God, not ourself. And here's the challenge. That it should be about God, how we love our spouse. It should be about God. 
how we parent our kids, it should be about God. How are we pointing them to Jesus? How are we discipling them and showing them what grace and truth and forgiveness looks like? The way that we manage our finances, it should be about Jesus. It should be about God. He's the main character. It's not really your money. God's given you that money to manage. How are you being a steward of those things? How are you treating people at your job and in your neighborhood and on Facebook? Are you reflecting God? Because he is the main character. And everything that we do as we walk through life, we need people. We want people. It should be our desire to see God in us, not us for us. Because I'm always going to let them down, but I should be pointing people to God, this main character that it should be all about. And then finally, what we see is this third point this morning, that while God calls um, inadequate people and he is always the main character, God demands obedience. God demands obedience. Look um, at verse eight, and we'll read these last few verses. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, prove yourself, or yourselves by working a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, take your staff, cast it down before Pharaoh, and it may become um, a serpent. I love this, verse 10. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and they did just as the Lord commanded. Now they've already gone to Pharaoh, but remember they were half-hearted. They didn't really fully tell uh, Pharaoh what God commanded. So they were disobedient that way. And finally, Finally, Moses and Aaron go and they obey God and they tell him exactly what Pharaoh or what God told them to tell Pharaoh and they do that. Now listen to what happens. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh summoned his wise men and his sorcerers and all his Harry Potter crew, okay? And the magicians of Egypt also did the same by their secret arts, these magicians. So they cast out their, their uh, staffs, and they become serpents. For each man cast his staff, they become serpents. I love this. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Can you imagine that? That's like one mamma jamma of a snake that's eating all the other snakes to show God's power, to show that he is the Lord. And it says, still, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. And next week, we're going to get into the consequences of that disobedience, but it brings us to this point that Moses and, and Aaron finally obey God. That when we're following him, we're going after him, when he's the main character, man, it demands obedience from you and I. And you might be here this morning and you might be saying, well, life isn't really going well. Maybe you're living in disobedience. I know that sounds harsh. Maybe things are not lining up and you're like, man, I'm really struggling in this life and you feel like God is just not really there, that he's not present, he's not working. The question on the table is, are you obeying him? Are you obeying God? Is he the main character in your life? He's calling you to him and for you to do something amazing, but it takes us stepping into obedience. So that's my last comment this morning. Obedience is our responsibility in God's plan. God cannot make you and me follow him. Man, he's calling you to obey. And for some of us, that might be a hard decision. That might be, hey, God's calling me to step up and move beyond kind of this cultural Christianity. I need to obey and, and really start to follow him. And so the, the band is gonna lead us in the closing song. And as they do, it is our responsibility to respond to this, to say, am I obeying God in this moment? Are you obeying God right now? And for some of you, you're like, I I've never obeyed God. And today God's speaking to me and the Holy Spirit's just resting. I feel like this burning sensation and I need to step into that. Man, I would love to talk to you. Maybe you could fill out the connect card. You, maybe you'll say, I just need to know more information about following Jesus. I would love to follow up with you and treat you to that. Maybe a step of obedience is, hey, I need to be baptized. Maybe it's begin to serve or begin to give. I know it's scary. Obedience is scary, but God is calling us to step into that. That is our responsibility as believers to walk with him and to say, you know what? I'm just gonna obey. I'm gonna humbly obey. Let's pray together. Father, so often we try to put life in our own hands and we try to make ourselves the main character in this story. And you're just kind of on the back burner somewhere. Oftentimes 
really the one that we blame when things don't go according to plan. And God, this morning we acknowledge the disobedience that is in our hearts so often that we try to make ourselves that main character and we end up disobeying what you're calling us to. And so Father, in, in our weaknesses and in our inadequacies, God, could you get the glory? Father, we know that you can, but will we step into obedience and say, God, I wanna follow you. I don't know what it's gonna look like and it's gonna have some fear, maybe even some doubt, but I just wanna be obedient because that's when you work. Let us be like Moses and Aaron that do exactly what you command us to do. Not ones that we try to put life in our own hands and think that we know better than you, God. You are sovereign and all powerful. And you showed up on that day um, to Pharaoh with the snakes and just swallowed up to show how powerful you are. Let us trust that power and your faithfulness. Because of sin, we are separated from you. And God, but because of your grace, you desire a relationship. Let us step into that obedience and acknowledge who we are without you and who we can be with you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Hey, let's stand. Let's worship um, God and just respond to however he's working in your heart this morning.